Today we're going to look at verses 39 through 43 here in Luke chapter 23. I'm going to actually spend a good portion of my time reviewing some things prior to touching on this, but let's read verses 39 through 43, and we'll get into our study this evening. We're looking at a final chance because that's what we see in these verses before us. Beginning at verse 39, Luke chapter 23, Luke writes, Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus has been betrayed by one of his disciples, a man by the name of Judas. Judas betrayed the Lord Jesus Christ to the hands of the authorities. Ultimately, he was placed under the jurisdiction of the Romans, and the Romans have sentenced him to die, and he's to die by crucifixion. We know that in the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ that his ministry lasted around three years. But in three years, Jesus, moving from the south to the north, ministered to multitudes, to many thousands of people, and, and many were following him. And during that three-year period, many began trusting him as their Lord and as their Savior. Just the prior Sunday, what we today are referring to as Palm Sunday, just the prior Sunday, Jesus had entered into the streets of Jerusalem, and as he had done so, the people had begun to line those streets and to begin to cry out to him. Mark tells us in, in Mark chapter 11, verses 8 through 10, that many spread their clothes on the road, others cut down leafy branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then those who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And so there was a great excitement that was taking place just a week before as Jesus was entering in there and people were lining the streets and throwing their clothing down and, and, and crying out, save now, save now. And, and as this excitement was growing and people were looking at him in a certain way, in the midst of all that excitement, as we know, there was a group of people who rejected him entirely. It was the religious leadership, the ones whom we know in Scripture as the Pharisees. When I was a new Christian and I would begin to read the Bible, I was taught you need to read through the Bible as, 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 as much as you can. You should read the Word of God. And so I began with the Gospels, and, and I was introduced to a group of people there, as you have been too. There are several groups of people that are mentioned. I, I didn't really know who they were. Over the years, I've discovered who they were, but one of those groups uh, was, the, San, was the, uh, the Pharisees, the people who were the religious instructors in the nation of Israel. And when you do a little reading and research on these people, you get an opportunity to see that they would probably fit into what today would be called the hardline religious conservatives of their time. They had opposition to another group, a group that was referred to as the Sadducees. They would have been referred to today as being the religious liberals. There was a political-minded group of people called the Herodians and a variety of others, the Zealots. And you see these names of people. Well, amongst these people were the religious leaders called the Pharisees. Though they were small in number and though much of their, their uh, business was really conducted in the city of Jerusalem and surrounding that particular area, they were only 6,000. Uh, but at the same time, they were very influential. And these people hated the Lord Jesus Christ. They hated Him with a passion. They hated the things that he said. They hated the things that he did in terms of his miracles. They went so far as to ascribe his miracles as being performed through the power of Satan himself. They just had a tremendous opposition to the Lord Jesus Christ. But one of the things that they hated most about him is that Jesus Christ was unlike them in that he was not one who would be referred to as a separated one. You see, the word Pharisee means the separated ones. And so Jesus did not act like they did, where the Pharisees knew that in coming into contact with those who were not kosher, those who didn't observe the uh, ritual washings and the various other things related to 
uh, in, the, uh, in the law of Moses, Jesus was somebody who would actually rub elbows at the same table with those whom the Pharisees had nothing to do with. And, and because they were the separated ones, they didn't understand why Jesus would actually have fellowship with or minister to those who were sinners as they understood sin. You see this in, in Matthew in chapter 9. I refer to this uh, fairly often because it's one of my passages that helps me to see this about him. It's found in Matthew 9, verses 10 through 13. And in that passage, it says, It happened as Jesus sat at the table in the house. Behold, many tax collectors, sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard that, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, those who are, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And as I was recently saying to you, that was their big problem. They did not like the idea that Jesus Christ actually ministered to those who were sinners. Yet in Luke, in chapter 19, verse 10, Jesus said, The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus did not reject the people. Jesus was there to minister to them. Now, he didn't go to these dinner parties in order to carouse. He didn't go to the parties to drink and party like them. He went with a specific purpose of communicating to them the message of the kingdom of God. The Pharisees, in that they dis, uh, disbelieved this message and in that they rejected Jesus, saw him as he would go near these people and be around these people, saw him as a sinner himself and and they just couldn't stand him. It's interesting that when Jesus would speak, you don't see him using scathing words against those who are lost. He saved those words for the religious leadership. It's interesting the words that he chooses to use when he's speaking concerning the Pharisees. He uses strong words. He uses the word hypocrite. He speaks of them as being blind guides. He refers to them as fools. He says that they are whitewashed tombs. He calls them serpents. He even referred to them as a brood of vipers. And when you read concerning his scathing words, you see that Jesus Christ had his greatest problem with religious hypocrisy. In Matthew, in chapter 23, when Jesus is speaking concerning this hypocrisy, in verse 5, he speaks to the Pharisees and says, all their works they do to be seen by men. In Matthew 23, verse 28, he says, You outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. You look good on the outside, but you see God can see your heart. And though you may look good to those who are on the outside and you have these beautiful outer garments and you, you pray and you fast and you give your, your alms and all and you do so ostentatiously to be seen by men and rewarded by them, Jesus said, I look beyond the outer appearance, and this is what he's saying to the religious leaders, and I look at your heart, and I see that it's filled with hypocrisy. In Matthew, in chapter 15, verses 7 and 8, he said to them, hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, these people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. So you can see that the Pharisees had reason to hate Jesus Christ. He, he pointed out their sin, and they didn't like it. They were extremely legalistic. They established man-made rules in order to establish outward righteousness. You see, when, when a man creates a religion, when a human being creates a religion, the goal or ideal of that religion is normally going to be achieved by human effort. They're going to have a lot of rules. They're going to have a lot of regulations. And these rules and regulations have to be followed in order that they might achieve the goal of an outward change. And so the more demanding, the, the better. Because if the outer goal is achieved, even if slightly, then the person who's achieving that outer goal is going to get glory. The fact is, you can change your outer behavior. But it's not the changing of the outer behavior that, that matters as much as the change of the nature. And if the nature remains the same, it doesn't really matter about the outer behavior. You can dress a monkey in a tuxedo, it remains a monkey. It may look nice, it may even get a date for the prom, but it's a monkey. 
because the nature hasn't been changed. The nature's exactly the same. It's just the outside has been dressed up. So rules and regulations, the Pharisees were famous for them. And these rules and regulations never change the person's nature. It does modify behavior, but it doesn't change their, their nature. So Jesus taught something that the Pharisees rejected. Jesus said that a person has to be born again. You have to receive a new nature. When one of the religious leaders whom re Jesus refers to as being the teacher of Israel, a man by the name of Nicodemus, approaches him by night, begins to speak to him and even in a sense may be flattering him, Master, we know that you are a teacher come from God. No man can do the works that you do unless God be with him. When Nicodemus begins to speak to Jesus as a religious man to a religious man and uses religious language, even speaking concerning miracles and how he has ascertained that, that the works that Jesus is doing must come from God, Jesus didn't begin to speak to him in a sense, as a religious man, Jesus spoke to him in a very practical sense. Unless a man is born again, he, can't in, he cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. Jesus was just flat out, straightforward, and he said, listen, Nicodemus, you have to have a new nature. And that's what God has promised to give. That's what the Pharisees didn't want to receive. But that's what Jesus came to communicate, that God will give to you a new nature. God will give to you an ability that is from within to do the things that are pleasing to Him and the things that you greatly desire to do, the things that are right before God. God has promised that. You see, in the Old Testament, you have the rules and regulations that I've mentioned to you that sometimes we like to limit them to the Ten Commandments. In reality, there were 613 laws that you find in the law. 613 specific commandments, reduced to 10, but in reality, actually 613. You have these rules and these regulations, but they're written on tablets of stone. The Ten Commandments were written by the finger of God on tablets of stone. And what God wants to do is God wants to write His law on the tablets of your heart, my heart, so that the things that I do, I'm doing from the inside because there is an inner desire and motivation. There's a love that I have for God that causes me to want to do those things. And so he takes his law and he promises to write on, on the tablets of your heart. You see that in the Old Testament book of Ezekiel in chapter 36 at verse 26. There God says, I'll give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. The worse men are, the worse men are, the more laws will be written. Because a nation can be judged by the amount of rules and regulations that have been established to govern its citizens. The kingdom of God when Jesus was asked concerning that, which is the great commandment in the law? A religious man, a, a lawyer asked him on one occasion, what is the great commandment in the law? He was speaking as what we would today refer to as a reductionist. He wanted to see these 613 laws reduced to one, two, or three. That's what they would do. They would take the great amount and they'd say, what is the most important of that? They would reduce it from 613 to a smaller number. And so this was something that the scribes at that time would do and argue amongst themselves which the most important law, which of the laws was the most important one. And so he came and he spoke to Jesus. And this is found in the book of Matthew in chapter 22, verses 35 through 40. And so, Master, what is the great command in the law? And Jesus said, um, There are basically two. He says, You're to love the Lord your God with everything that is within you, and you're to love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said, upon these two hang all the law and the prophets. Everything is summarized in one real law, which is love God, but it's worked out as you love man. Because it's possible for someone to be religious in the sense that they would claim, I love God, but they hate people. We have religions today that will say, I love God so much, I'll blow you up. And so Jesus would say, that isn't the way it's done. 
It isn't that you dress your son up in some bombs to go and kill the infidel. It's that God dressed his son up in human flesh to die on our behalf. And there's an entire difference between the two that we understand as Christians, you see. God said it's all summarized in a new nature. If any man be in Christ, Paul said, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. And then he uses the word behold as if, what a surprise, what a blessing. Behold, all things are become new. All things, you're brand new. And so God gives to you a new nature. And Jesus came speaking that. Jesus came teaching that. Jesus came saying that you need to receive him as Lord and Savior. The Pharisees did not want to hear that. They saw the works that he did, so they ascribed them to Satan. They hear the words that he speaks, and they call him a false teacher. They got to the point where they found a way to have him put to death. Because Jesus was making a claim that to them was absolutely outrageous. Jesus actually went so far as to say that he was the only way for a person to be able to make it to heaven. Jesus was so outrageous in that claim. I mean, the, the Pharisees had a great difficulty with that. How dare you say that you are the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man could come to the Father but by you. How dare you say that? Very much like people today. I, people today have no problem with you and, and with me being a religious person. As a matter of fact, they'd probably say that if, 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 if that's what you want, that's fine with me. What they have a problem is, is, is when we say, and our faith tells us that there's one way to God. Now, at that point, you've got a problem. Because for the world, the only requirement to go to heaven is to simply die. Everybody goes. But Jesus never taught that. Jesus never said everybody automatically goes to heaven. Jesus said he's the way to heaven. And that to them was outrageous. It was beyond anything that they could receive. But this indeed is what he had taught. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 11, please, for a moment. I want to read to you out of verses 28 through 30 and, and uh, develop this a little bit further. Matthew chapter 11, very famous portion of Scripture. Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30. This is an invitation Jesus is giving to people who are hearing him. And he speaks and he says in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Come to me. All you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. And so Jesus is giving an invitation there for people to come in order that they might receive rest. Come unto me, all you who are laboring and are heavy labor, labor and in heavy labor, and I will give you rest. And that's an incredible promise. I mean, it was an incredible promise 2,000 years ago, but it's an incredible promise today because in all of our busyness and all the frustrating activity that we call life today, Jesus is, is there still calling out saying, I'll give you rest. That's something that we as a nation can somewhat understand, the need for rest, because we live in a very busy and a very anxious world. The Bible in Ecclesiastes in chapter 2, verses 22 and 23 says, What does a man get for all the toil and anxious striving with which he labors under the sun? All his days his work is pain and grief, and even at night his mind doesn't rest. This, too, is meaningless working as hard as you can, and you go home at night, and you take the job with you. And you're laying in your bed before you go to sleep, and you're thinking, man, I've got so much on the plate tomorrow, I should have stayed a little longer. I've got too much to do. And we're filled with anxiety. And, and that's not just for people who are out in the workforce. Recently, a friend of mine and I were having a conversation, and he was sharing with me about a friend of his who is a minister, and his, his friend who is a minister was working 
six days a week, 75 hours a week. That's his average. Six days a week, 75 hours a week. That's his average. He was in his office, and uh, his eight-year-old called him up and said, Dad, are you going to come home? And he says, what do you mean? He says, you remind me of my uncle who visits us once in a while, and I was just wondering, are you ever going to come home? His son thought he had moved out of the house because his son hadn't seen him for so long, he was sure his dad had moved out. And he said, I'd like to set up an appointment with you, Dad. Can I have a couple of hours? Because he knew his father as a minister would set up appointments and minister to people. So his eight-year-old calls him up for an appointment. So naturally, he went directly home at that moment to go see his baby, eight years old. We get caught up, not just people who are working in the workforce. We get caught up. We all do. We can get caught up with busyness. We can get caught up with anxiety. We get caught up even doing good things. But we, we are not in peace, and we're not at rest. And, and, and Jesus was saying, listen, I can give you rest. And so he's saying, I want to give you that rest. Now, he especially wants to give us forgiveness of sins that we might enter into the rest that comes through having a relationship with him. And it's an invitation that's open to anybody. That's what he's saying, come unto me, any of you, all of you who labor and are heavy laden, come unto me as an invitation for anybody who's willing to come. In Matthew chapter, rather in Acts chapter 10, verse 43, uh, we read, to him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. And so he's saying, listen, you can come to me, you can receive remission of sins, forgiveness of sins, and, and you'll have a spiritual rest that you'll find through being with me. Now, notice how here in Matthew 11, how it, it, it speaks concerning an invitation. And the invitation is to all who labor, he says, and are heavy laden. That word labor speaks of to be utterly exhausted from work. Utterly exhausted from work. You work so hard that you are just so tired that you're basically ready to collapse. When he speaks of being heavy laden, it speaks as, as when you're carrying a heavy burden, a great weight. So it's as if you've got this huge burden on your shoulder that you're carrying and you're so tired. But the burden he's speaking about is the burden of unforgiven sin. It's that sense of, I just don't know if God accepts me. It's that burden that is, is in, in a person who's unsaved who's saying, I, I'm not sure that I've been forgiven. I get letters from people. They write me uh, via our, um, our webpage and my, and my address there, and, and I get quite a number of letters, and, and, and a number of those letters uh, are from people who are saying, I need to get right with God. I need to have rest with God. I mean, that is a common theme, and, and that's what Jesus speaks about. You can have a heavy burden of unforgiven sin. In Isaiah chapter 1, verse 4, we read, a sinful nation, a people loaded with guilt, a brood of evildoers, children given to corruption. They've forsaken the Lord. They've spurned the Holy One of Israel and turned their backs on Him. They are a people loaded with guilt. And that's what a lot of people are, loaded with guilt. So Jesus is looking out there and the Pharisees know what he's doing, and he's saying, come to me. Don't go to the religious system that's going to give you a yoke that, that your forefathers couldn't carry. Don't go to a system that is going to load more things on you. Come to the one who can set you free. He's saying, I can give you rest. I can give you rest from your labor. That word rest speaks about resting from labor. It also can speak of rest uh, after you've taken a long journey, and, and he's saying your life's journey is going to be complete in me. You can be revived, you can be settled, and you can be at peace in me if you come to me. Notice how he says, uh, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Now, when he says take my yoke, that was a rabbinic term. It represents the sum total of obligations a person must take upon himself. When you read the writings of the rabbis, they speak of the yoke of the law, the yoke of the commandments, the yoke of the kingdom of heaven. And this yoke has become a burden. 
But Jesus said, I'll set you free. In Galatians 5, 1, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then. Do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. When you're saved, just walk in the grace of God. Just enjoy Him and love Him. And I've said this before. A woman whose husband had passed away over time had met another man and had remarried. And she had moved all of her things, her possessions, and put much of what she had in a, a trunk, and that trunk was placed in an attic. And that attic had been up, rather, that trunk had been in the attic for, for some time, for years, actually. And one day she went up into that attic, and she was straightening things, and she came up to that trunk, and she remembered that she had put a lot of things there, and and, and started going through it to see if perhaps she had placed something there that she might need. And as she did that, she found a list. And, and as she's reading this list, it was like number one, you know, to number 15. And, and it said things like um, pay the bills, uh, put gas in the car, you know. And she realized that this was a list that her, her previous husband had made for her, and then she remembered that prior to uh, his death, that's what he used to do. He used to write her lists every week for the things that he wanted her to do, and, and she would dutifully do all of those things. And, and as she was reading this list and seeing all these things that he was telling her to do, it, it dawned on her that th those are the things that she was already doing for her new husband. And the things that she used to do because they were commanded of her by her old husband were the things that she, out of love, did for her new husband. And, and in a sense, there are things that we, before we came to Christ, might have thought, well, I shouldn't lie, I shouldn't steal, I shouldn't do these things because they're not right to do. And maybe if I try real hard, God will accept me. But in reality, we never have a sense of peace with the Lord because we realize that somehow inside of us that we're never going to be good enough. But then you come to Christ and... And when you come to the Lord, you realize that the things that at one time you wanted to do but simply didn't have the power to do are the things that you now do because He supplies the power and the motivation is love. It's love for Him. And He says this. And He says, learn from me because I am gentle and I am lowly. He said, and my burden is light. His burden is light because He did all the work for your salvation when He carried that cross and He died on it. There's a musician that was very popular when I was a new believer. His name is Chuck Gerard. Some of you perhaps have heard of him. He was uh, one of the founding members of a group called Love Song, and, and he went off on his own and started doing some music uh, as a single artist. And, and he has a song that I remember from the early 70s called uh, Lay Your Burden Down. Lay your burden down. And, and part of that song, uh, Chuck says, in that song he says, you've been trying hard to make it all alone, trying hard to make it on your own, and the strength you once were feeling isn't there no more. And you think the wrong you've done is just too much to be forgiven, but you know that isn't true. Just lay your burden down. He has forgiven you. And that song ministered to me as a young believer because that's what God calls us to do, to lay that burden down. Because the Lord Jesus Christ said, learn from me and I will give you rest. And as the Lord was teaching this message, it's angering the Pharisees and, and the religious authorities are rejecting him consistently, continuously, and, and they're rejecting his message. And so now they want him to die. And, and the capper was when he, when he stated that he is the Son of God. That's why in John chapter 19, verse 7, they said to Pilate, according to our law, he ought to die. He made himself the Son of God. And so that charge, that religious charge, was not sufficient for him to receive capital punishment. So they gave, to him, gave the charge in secular terms in order that he might be put to death. And we see that here, back in Luke chapter 23, and that's your introduction,
We see here in Luke chapter 23 and verse 32 that there were two others who were criminals who were led with him to be put to death. These two robbers were crucified next to him, violent men, as I mentioned before, capable of murder. And so they put Jesus Christ there between these two thieves in order that they might present him as a criminal amongst criminals. They had come to a place called Calvary, and the Bible makes it very clear that is where they crucified him. As I share with you, every time we go through our Easter season, crucifixion was the Roman method of capital punishment. The wrists would be impaled with spikes, the legs would be twisted and nailed. They would be placed on a sharpened iron saddle peg. The cross was normally made up of two pieces of rough wood, a post and a cross beam. The crucified person would be nailed to the crossbeam or raised by cords to the crossbeam and nailed to it. The cross itself was usually twice the height of the man. And while Jesus would be on that cross, he would suffer dislocation of his shoulders. He endured suffocation. His veins would be bulging. There'd be a congestion of blood in his head, his lungs, and his heart. And he's there voluntarily because the Bible makes it very clear that God demonstrated his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And the Bible makes it clear that no man took his life from him, but that he had power to lay it down. He also had the power to take it back up. And so, as I mentioned before, the nails didn't keep him on that cross. It was his love for us that kept him there. And he was an offering for sin. Mark tells us that the crucifixion occurred at 9 in the morning. So by now, Jesus is in excruciating pain. His legs are beginning to tighten up. He's going to begin to have muscle spasms. In order to breathe, he has to lift himself up so that his lungs will be capable of taking in air. But because he's resting on a sharpened peg, Every time he lifts himself up, that sharpened peg is driven into his back. His back has already been opened up by the lashing that he received. His back was like hamburger, and this, this peg keeps going up and down on his back every time he lifts himself up. He has to lift himself up in order to take in air. But as he's doing so, his shoulders, his arms, his back, and his legs are beginning to cramp. He wasn't, his legs were not straight. His legs were actually in a serpentine or in an S shape. A nail has been placed, a single nail uh, in, his, in, in his ankle, by his ankle, and it has not broken a bone but gone between the bones in order to fasten, fasten him there on that, on that post. And so, just the twisting in order for him to get up and, and go back down was something that exhausted him. And so, his, his body is in cre incredible pain. He's dehydrating. And instead of lashing out, he begins to do something that is mind-boggling. Verse 34, as we saw this last time, he actually begins to pray, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they're doing. Normally, those who were dying on the cross would shriek in pain, they would curse, they would beg, sometimes they would even spit at their tormentors, but Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus reveals mercy. Ezekiel 33, 11, again, it says, As I live, saith the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. And so he's praying for them, and the soldiers are there, and the people are there at the foot of the cross, and they're gambling for his clothes, and the rulers and the people are mocking him, and they're crying out, and they're saying to him, save yourself. Look out for number one. But if he'd have come off that cross, we'd have been doomed forever. And as this is taking place, verse 39 says, one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, if you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for 
we receive the due reward of our deeds. This man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. And so you have this first thief. And at the heart of his, of his uh, comment, if you are the Christ, save yourself and us, would have to be, get me off of this cross. I'm not repenting. I want to continue living the way that I did. Just get me off the cross. You don't see a fear of God. You don't see any sorrow. You see no repentance. You see no sense that he deserved his punishment. It's just a picture of a sin-hardened man. This man was a person who just didn't believe that he was that bad. I was reading the newspaper just a couple of days ago about an individual who was guilty of killing three people. He, he killed two people in order that he might um, take one of their possessions. He wanted their possession, therefore he killed them, and then he killed somebody else. He killed three people. And he was giving comments at his, um, when he was receiving his, his uh, sentencing. And, and he said, well, I still believe in my heart that I'm, just, I'm a good person. And, and I thought as I read that, I said, the deceptiveness of sin, I, I'm a good person, you know. I'm a good person. I only killed three people and I wanted their, their possessions. And, um, but I, in my heart of hearts, I'm a good person. He couldn't even admit to himself, even before those who were senten sentencing him, that, that he was guilty. It's like this man here. It's like this man. This man here is on a cross, and instead of saying, I've only got a few hours to live, I ought to make my peace with God. By the way, God is next to me. I ought to talk to him. Instead of doing that, he starts to yell at Jesus and lash at him. No sense of sorrow, no repentance. As a matter of fact, he'd been mocking Jesus throughout the ordeal. The other thief also. Mark 15, 32 says, even those who were crucified with him reviled him. So this man has been doing this for some time. But at a certain point, verse 40, the other answering rebukes him and says, do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And, and we indeed justly, we receive the due reward of our deeds. This man has done nothing wrong. And, and something has taken place. As time has been passing, the second thief's conscience is now provoked. And, and he actually rebukes this guy. And he's saying to him, wake up. You're about to enter into eternity and you're not even concerned. Wake up. We're going to die. We deserve it. What we did deserves the penalty that we're receiving. We, we are evil. We have done evil things. But he's been watching the Lord. He's been watching Jesus. He's been listening to him and, and watching his response and seeing the things that he's been doing and hearing the words that he's been saying and and, and, and it has provoked him and has done something to him. And, and so for this man, he, he's aware of eternity. And, and, and I'm telling you, you know, when you're healthy, everything's okay. You really think you're going to live forever. But when your health begins to, to go on you, when something happens to awaken you to the brevity of life, when you finally wake up one day saying, there's no guarantee I'm going to live until tomorrow. You start thinking differently. When you're young, as I was once, I, I knew I was guaranteed to live, you know, many, many years. At least that's what I thought. As I've grown older, I realize that I have less, less uh, my path has less in front than it does behind. And I find it interesting. People my age are referred to as middle-aged. And that's if they expect to live to be 120. Give me a break. Middle-aged. No. And I, and I am at that point, and, and I have been for some time, of realizing, you know, the brevity of life. Well, this man here who's dying hasn't even considered it, even as he's dying. But the other one, on the other hand, has been watching Jesus, listening to him, and has become aware of the fact that this man next to me is a lot different than I am and is most de definitely different than this companion of mine. And that's why he begins to re rebuke him. This man obviously believed in an afterlife. He believed that the soul lived on after death, and this man was concerned. You could see that in the Old Testament. Ecclesiastes, for example, chapter 3, verse 21 says, Who knows the spirit of the sons of men, which goes upward, and the spirit of the animal, which goes down to the earth? 
They know that there's a difference being a between a human life and an animal life, though a lot of people today don't see the difference between the two. People get more outraged with people wearing fur than they do abortion. A lot more outraged over people wearing fur than they do about people having abortion. They, they think that human life and animal life are equal. But the Bible doesn't teach that at all. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7 says, the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit will return to God who gave it. In Daniel, in chapter 12, verse 2, many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. This man knew that he had two options, either to have life or to be in contempt. He knew that. He knew the Spirit would go to be with the God who gave it. He knew that one day he'd be standing in some form of judgment, and he became aware of that. And there he is on a cross about to die, and he has to make peace with God. So while one is rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ, this other one is being touched. That gives to us the insight, it's never too late. He recognizes his own sin. I mean, when he turns and speaks to the man and asks him, do you not fear God? Well, the fear of God is the beginning of knowledge. He recognizes Jesus' innocence because he says, we've been condemned justly. This man has done nothing wrong. So what he's doing is acknowledging that he's guilty of sin, and then he's recognizing Jesus as king, and he says to him, remember me when you enter into your kingdom. That would be what we today might call a sinner's prayer. He says, remember me. In other words, forgive me, Jesus. Grant me mercy. You are able to do that. You are the king. That's how you got saved, by the way, and that's how I got saved. I recognize my own sin. I recognize Jesus' innocence. I recognize that he's the king, and I asked him to give me forgiveness. And that's how I got saved. Well, Jesus speaking to him says in verse 43, Assuredly, I say to you, today you'll be with me in paradise. That word paradise is a Persian word. It speaks of a garden, the word paradise. The Persian king would take a person in his kingdom who had proven to be worthy and as a reward would actually give him access to a personal visitation in paradise, in his private garden, the king's garden. That word is used in the Bible in this context to refer to heaven. But he's saying to him, you're going to be with me in my garden, literally. So we know that gardens in the Bible are interesting one. We know there's a garden in Eden where sin is introduced to humanity. We know there's a garden called Gethsemane where Jesus yields himself up to defeat sin's power. And we know that there's a garden awaiting us because that's an offer of heaven. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 7, it says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I'll give to eat from the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So when Jesus was speaking to him, he was saying to him, What you have just done is you have just entered into a faith relationship with me, and by asking me to remember you, I want you to know that you're going to enter into paradise. He didn't have to do a single good work, did he? How much time did he have to do good things? He didn't get off that cross and go receive water baptism, did he? He looked at him as he was dying there, and he simply said, remember me. And Jesus said, I will never forget you because you will be with me in paradise. And that's the promise that he still gives to us. Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know that you're not. I know you died to save me. Forgive me. Remember me. And Jesus says, I will. I will give to you to eat of the tree of life in the midst of the paradise of God.